when I can't do as much with my brush, I think I do more with my instincts. Welcome to the World Watercolor Month video challenge. World Watercolor Month is a global celebration of this beautiful medium of watercolor and it's happening all through July. Today, however, I'm going to be painting along with our World Watercolor Month prompt, but I'm not doing this alone. I have a bunch of other artists I've invited to take part in this video challenge and they're sharing their videos here on YouTube as well. After the video, click the link below the hashtag World Watercolor Month video challenge so that you can see the other artists participating and uh, watch watch the videos that they've created. Uh, come back next week, we're gonna do it all again. And if you wanna participate in World Watercolor Month, visit worldwatercolormonth.com to find out how you can get involved. Use the hashtag World Watercolor Month. And if you're posting a video, uh, include World Watercolor Month video challenge in your hashtags as well. I'm celebrating World Watercolor Month with a new video every day in July. So today's prompt is me mechanism and here I am with uh, something that might look familiar to me if you've been following along with my wa World Watercolor Month prompts. And this is the reference photo that I used for our first prompt of sunlit. Thinking about mechanisms uh, and this subject, uh, first of all I tend to go straight to the idea that there's a mechanism, uh, a way of, uh, that I have structured my painting practice so that there are certain things that I can reasonably rely on. I have some tools that I use, some mechanisms for helping me break down a, a reference photo and uh, paint my subject. Uh, the mechanism of my camera, <laughs> which took this reference photo, is a tool that I use for helping me remember the details and capture my subject. The mechanism of converting that photograph to black and white, another tool um, that helps me to simplify and then I have uh, the mechanism of my paintbrush, which is the tool I use for applying paint to the paper. Uh, it is that, that intermediary between my hand directly on the paper. And uh, anything actually can become a mechanism, or almost anything, for delivering paint to the paper. And that's kind of what I wanted to explore today. How can I maybe bring the application of paint to paper, um, this idea of mechanism, into that subject. And so I think the very first tool mechanism I want to use is um, my crayon. Uh, I want to first sketch out this subject, but I want to do it in a way that uh, I do feel a little bit more removed from control uh, than I might ordinarily feel. So with my idea of mechanism, uh, I'm going to use this water-soluble Neocolor crayon, which is uh, the sepia color. Uh, it's a really nice neutral. And I'm thinking I want a tool to help me hold it so that I'm letting go of control just a little bit. And I think I have something here in the corner of my studio. Um, I, want, I have a couple of somethings. <laughs> so the first thing I can try is uh, I have a couple of different clips. I can try holding uh, the crayon in one of these clips. This one's really brute-like. Brute it's got a very strong bite. Is this going to change the grip with which I hold my pencil? Um, it really does and it's kind of tilting and angling my, my pencil so I can't press very hard. Um, that's actually a really good structure. It's a, it's a mechanism to help me try to keep all the details in place. Uh, if this feels weird to you, <laughs> Um, it could be that you're trying to be an artist who is in control of all the details. And I'm learning, as I've painted for more years than I've not painted in my life, uh, that I actually want to be in less in control than, um, than I have been in the past, when I thought control was going to be the secret that made me a better painter. Uh, sometimes uh, adaptability and <laughs> resilience, these are tools that work a lot better. Okay, so the clip was semi, semi working, uh, but I think I can probably do a little bit better than that. I'm gonna grab a piece of masking tape to hold. Here's a, here's a paintbrush. And um, actually, if I had a, I don't know, um, it would be neat to have a little piece of like pipe or tubing or something that I could stick it in, but we're just gonna tape it. And I just realized I taped the wrong end. I'm gonna turn it <laughs> and tape it and give it a little bit of length. And so I can grip it a little higher. 
and um, that's going to give me kind of a feel like I'm holding a paintbrush rather than I'm holding a, a pencil. So we're going to see what that does. And right away I'm instantly feeling a lack of control. So let's just focus on sketching out some of those little bushes with the dark um, lines. There's a lot of dark stuff here, dark shadows in here. We're going to just add some darks. The paper is very textured. This is rough paper made by Hanamula. They are a, I believe they're a sponsor of World Watercolor Month and they've provided me with paper to use today. Thank you, Hanamula. I love their collection watercolor paper and uh, especially this size of uh, paper. It makes a really good um, size for video, first of all. And it's a nine by 12, so it makes it also affordable to frame. There's a lot of uh, frames out there in that size range. So here I have a mechanism that has helped me make marks on my paper without uh, as much control as I might have if I was gripping the pencil. So that's a start. Uh, another mechanism I have, and this is a little more like a machine, we've got a pump <laughs> and a spray bottle. And so with this spray bottle, I can start delivering some water to the paper. And with the water soluble uh, pencil, that means it's gonna start to loosen and soften some of the marks I've just placed. And I frequently use a spray bottle to release shapes on my paper and uh, my illusions of control. And so as uh, you can see that there's a little bit of color radiating out from those marks that I've made, really seeing that um, some of that pigment just come off the paper. I can use the crayon even onto the wet page and uh, then the, the crayon gets wet and we start to get a little more pigment yet. One reason I like thinking about this idea of mechanism is it's really helpful for me to think about letting go of uh, some of that control that not so much, so often we put this pressure on ourselves that every decision we make, uh, mechanism of palette knife, uh, every decision we make is life or death for our paintings. And that's a huge amount of pressure to put on an artist, thinking about the fact that you're gonna put your brush on the paper, you're in charge, and if you make the wrong choice, it's devastation. And I feel like this idea of kind of letting a little bit of these um, mechanical processes um, make, make some of the choices for you and I'm just kind of scraping up a little bit of dried pigment from this palette. This is Rockwell's Onat Diamond Yellow. And I'm um, just touching that raw pigment, um, very saturated in the first spot it touches and then dragging it out a little bit. Um, and then because the paper is wet, uh, this, the mechanism of the spray bottle <laughs> and the um, movement that that water creates you know it's it's taking so much of the decision making process away i have no detail control right now and so i can place a little color i can drag with my palette knife but i'm not using a brush in the traditional sense where every every decision is orchestrated and controlled and uh, for me this is a it's a freedom exercise uh, I'm giving up a little bit of responsibility in order to discover that maybe there's some possibilities. Uh, with the point of the palette knife, I can draw some branches, little twiggy shapes, kind of liking that idea. I'm going to link in the description below the video, not just to the resources, but I want to link to you to a artist I follow. Um, or a collaboration of artists I follow on Instagram, uh, Lolo and Sasaku. Uh, they create machines that make marks on paper and it it actually really inspires me and it's, it's kind of fun that it does because often uh, people complain on their website uh, or where uh, sometimes they'll get featured uh, on an art site and so many people are kind of haters about it. Like, why are you, this isn't art, it's machines you know, making random marks on paper. Uh, and I have a different perspective because those machines were made by people and the, those people chose that 
avenue for their creative communication. And I think that says something, uh, and I, I'm sure that they would tell you the same, that there's a statement that they can make on the relationships of humanity with our machines. Uh, this idea that we can uh, make art completely devoid of any kind of mechanism for um, creating our art or making choices about our art. Um, we do use mechanisms all the time. The uh, rule of thirds, the golden triangle, uh, the different names people, people use for uh, composition and design, these structural rules for what um, might make the design of your painting more pleasing, they're actually mathematically inspired. Uh, how can we say that uh, we're just going to, we can't make art in a vacuum. And uh, I think that's kind of the message that uh, can be communicated by these, by this idea of working alongside of a machine. So I've been using my palette knife. Uh, I've used the crayon, but attached to, you know, that third party um, handle. Uh, I'm trying to think what would be the next mechanism that I want to bring into my painting. And um, I'm really loving the, the mechanism of this mixed pigment. This Onat Diamond Yellow is a green that separates into yellow and blue. And you can see uh, that that has brought some real lovely um, color to this painting. Now, I've, I've laid a little bit of a challenge for myself in this idea of working with uh, the help of mechanisms. And I, I don't want to be uh, a never say, uh, I'm going to touch the paper with a brush. I might get there. Um, but we're, I just want to kind of linger over these little third party uh, pieces of input from the crayon, palette knife, spray bottle. Another way to make this happen, I think, would be to maybe try pouring um, the mechanism of fluid paint. And I need something to mix up a little fluid paint so I can pour. Just a little murky color in there. We'll let that live. We'll bring in some of this gold ochre. I'm thinking about the weeds in the foreground. Um, I don't really have an orange in the palette, but I do have, I can drop in a little bit of this rose red and maybe a little more of the gold ochre. A little bit more water will dilute it a bit more. I have a little pipette that I think I should be able to I should have mixed more liquid paint. So I've slurped up a bit of pretty much all of the color. Let's try that again. See if we can't get it all. Almost all of it, perfect. So let's just see if we can't administer it. Um, I'm gonna drag the pipette through some of the wet patches in the paper. Oh, squeeze, blurp. Okay, another question, is gravity a mechanism? <laughs> I'm gonna tilt my, my paper here. We'll use this little bowl to give us an angle. And we'll start to let that color move. I can draw downwards. Maybe we've got some of these um, stems of weeds. And I think this is interesting because the original painting was kind of a sunlit theme. The focus was on kind of traditional, oh, these, these little lines are so pretty. Um, traditional watercolor, plein air style painting. And um, here we are now doing something with the same subject non-traditionally. And, and for you, I would encourage you just to think about, you know, which of these uh, do you like better uh, aesthetically? Uh, but also, which of these was more is more fun? Like, what engages you more with the subject or with thinking about um, how you approach watercolor? Because as you think about developing your style as an artist, get a little juicy there, um, you want to be really focused on what trying to learn how to paint what engages you, what makes you feel f um, free, inspired, excited. Those are the, the areas where you want to spend your time. I 
think I'm going to pull a line across here just to suggest um, distant horizon. I have actually a lot of control with this little pipette splurting out just a little bit of color. Uh, but onto the wet paper, of course, then it's free to kind of go and do what it wants to do. And so suddenly I have an intuitive subject. going to rinse my pipette here. Uh, an intuitive subject that I've painted using the tools at my disposal and not my bare hands. I have other tools I could use and bring in. And actually, I will I'll take a minute and do that. I have this twig. And I'm trying to decide which end I want to try to paint with. And maybe it would be better if I, like, bundled my twigs. But I'm going to start maybe with this end. Just draw it through some paint here. Now one thing I think uh, as well that happens when I when I bring in the vehicle of uh, maybe a, a piece of nature, uh, and you could think about feathers, um, you know, sticks and twigs. You can you can carve uh, handles or points on them, so you have different widths to to work with. But I like the way that this brings, uh, because I'm painting the natural landscape, it kind of brings an affinity for the subject, I feel like. Um, a bit of kind of compassion and connection for what I'm painting that I don't always uh, think about when I'm simply working from a photograph with a paintbrush that's been made in a factory or at least you know looks very very polished I don't think necessarily about the relationship between landscape and you know the tools at my disposal and I love the idea that I can use um, pieces of nature as my mechanism for you know creating this subject that I have a deep affinity for and connection to and whether or not anybody else knows that you're doing this that you're bringing in uh, this nature. Um, I have a little bird's nest and I'm wondering about the woven grasses. If I dip them in paint and stamped with that, would that make an interesting effect? I'm not quite ready to destroy my bird nest in finding out. So maybe that will have to be for another time or, or another bird's nest next time I found it, find an abandoned one. Um, I think the robins never seem to come back to their to their original nests, so uh, maybe I'll try try working with that at some point. I'm loving the hints of blue in the landscape here. Um, I'm feeling very landscape connected, and I think that informs my painting with the kind of beauty that is really exciting to me. Little pops of pure pigment trying to just scratch out every little um, grain of pigment that's trapped in the little rough end of my twig here. And I might even be scratching the paper a little bit so that if color, uh, if water flows over the paper, I might get um, some of the textural marks left behind by uh, the just the gouging of the paper that kind of happens as you're drawing on the page bring a little bit of this Mars Brown in just for some darker shadows. Oh, I like that little scrubby mark making business. Scratch. Little bowl is disorienting when I look at it through the, through the screen. Um, okay, there needs, I, I'd like to Put in some strong, stronger, bigger shapes, and I'm wondering if I can do that with my palette knife, or if I need to go to a brush, or some other kind of tool. It's just no, all the pigments on the top of the palette knife. Place and drag. I don't think I'm getting a big enough mark. I want to create some larger marks, and I'm trying to figure out a good way to do that. Uh, and because I haven't used a paintbrush yet, I'm really tempted to keep it that way. I, I do have at my disposal my very scruffiest brush, which to me feels almost like, you know, like we're not using a brush at all, really. So I could be thinking about that. Let's mix up a little bit of color that could work for 
um, the bigger, sh maybe cool shadow shapes that would go down below here. So if I was using a brush, which I guess I am, maybe they go in here, use a brush that gives me very little control. few darks uh, up here building up into those bigger shapes I'd like that little bit of sunlight flowing in that looks really pretty this is a dark green cool dark green we'll add a little blue to it to make it a little bit cooler let some of those yellows show through and that actually I think does kind of give the finishing touches that I want this painting to have I want a looseness um, there might be a need for well I just don't know there might be a need for adding a few detail strokes once it's dry uh, we might come back and do that but really I'm quite happy with this and with this demonstration of bringing that intermediary <laughs> into your painting process and it's not just an intermediary that helps you let go of control but it can actually be one that helps you connect with your subject um, when you think about maybe bringing in you know something that connects you to your environment that you're painting i really believe in this idea of having an affinity with what you're painting having a um compassion for your subject which I know might sound a little bit weird to you um, it's just a landscape they're just trees but to me it's this idea of it's a place that means something and uh, if not to you to somebody else well it does mean something to you because you chose to paint it you thought it was beautiful enough to pick up your brush and uh, throw paint at and so that um, that connection and community you want that to come through in your painting process and sometimes we get so fixed on control um, trying to make it look like the thing that we forget that it's this affinity that really brings your painting to life and um, when I can't do as much with my brush I think I do more with my instincts and that's what's making uh, this painting feel more interesting and exciting to me than a more realistic version. So I've been kind of peeking in on this painting, mulling it over, and uh, I just, I really don't want to do too much to it. I love the liveliness that is happening between the crisper marks and the soft marks and how they kind of really blend together. But I do think that a little bit of strong um, emphasis in some of our darks can help bring this painting together. So I've got this Onat Diamond Yellow on my brush. And I'm just using a big kind of quill brush. It's got a big squashy mop point. Actually, let's throw another brush in my other hand. We'll alternate between them. Uh, this will give me the op opportunity to kind of get some water on the brush and then maybe just bring in a little bit of softness. Um, you know, I've used the mechanism of uh, twigs and just all of the different mark making potential with some non-standard tools and coming in with my uh, paintbrush um, is um, using a mechanism as well. I have a tool in my hand that's creating a structure for my shapes and the tool I use and what uh, I apply to that tool is all a part of that idea of working with um, yeah, tools to help you uh, express your subject. Uh, your style, your theme of your work. And um, I'm just squashing that big moppy brush. It's pretty dry, so I can get a little bit of dry brush, maybe some crisper edges there uh, around the edges. And then with that switch to the wet brush, I can soften and blend marks and pull a little bit of that green color down into some of those lighter areas as well. Really fun to to do that. Uh, I'm going to grab some of the gold ochre and bring some of this color that was down here 
up into my trees just a little bit um, while this green is wet up here. Let those things blend in. I want to point out, and, and this is one reason I think I like this conversation about mechanisms, is that it, no, it it's not, nothing is riding on my ability to wield this brush perfectly. If, if I can show you anything through this process, it's that an inadvertent mark can have so much potential for your painting. And so squashing your brush down, twisting it, dragging, using it with a lot of pressure or just a little bit of pressure, all of these things can serve a purpose to draw. Uh, it, it doesn't, it's not all on you being the perfect painter and getting everything right. And that's really, I think, one reason I like to use these tools um, to take less, to take control away out of my hands. I can clamp down on my brush and hold really close and I can draw a careful line and if that line is not perfectly straight, you know, maybe I'm going to panic and, and feel like I need to blot it up or fix it. But the fact is, is that there's so much beauty that happens in uh, letting the paint move as it w wishes to, um, being a little bit um, intuitive with your marks. And um, this little line right here and the way it kind of widens out here to suggest a tree popping in front of my landscape, my horizon, it's, it's a piece of, it's a beautiful thing. It's something that's really pleasing to look at. And um, I don't get that when I'm clamped down and trying to control every, every shape. And so one thing I've really learned over the years is that letting um, accidents happen has been really powerful for my um, level of trust that I place into this painting process. Uh, one thing I really like to do when I'm painting is kind of um, work this give and take. So often when I've placed a, a certain kind of mark, in this case with the um, Neocolor um, Water Soluble Crayon, I sometimes lose it, it gets buried under additional colors. Um, and so I come back with that um, tool again and just bring a little bit of that back into the painting, into presence there. And that's another uh, thing to consider uh, as you're thinking about maybe adding finishing touches or details to your painting. Uh, the other thing you can do is use the mechanism of not touching your paper at all. And I'm not sure that this quill brush is a good choice for spatter. It seems to want to kind of spatter everything in a straight line. I have to tap it quite firmly. Um, different brushes are going to release color in different ways. But then I am going to get a little layer of texture from uh, the spatter that I didn't have with that control. A little bit of burnt umber slash Mars Brown. There's a little bit of both on the brush just finishing touches uh, sometimes they take longer because you're going to look at your painting for a little bit longer than you might have um, when you were painting that soft first layer where everything's blending together but you also um, are going to spend less time with your brush on the paper more time looking less time actually putting color down just a tiny bit of cobalt blue in, in the painting as well, up in some of these upper areas, pulling us forward, away from the horizon, and then back into the horizon maybe as well. Just, uh, I, love, I love a little cobalt blue. Okay, we're gonna call that finished. Uh, let it dry. Uh, I'll take a photo of it and you'll see that on the thumbnail. Uh, I link to all of the colors that I've used today are is in the description below as well. Remember, I'm painting every day in July. I'll be sharing a video here on YouTube for World Watercolor Month, uh, sometimes video demos like this, and sometimes I'll be sharing tips for you as an artist to help you grow as an artist or build your art business and uh, or mindset encouragement to help you stay focused and encouraged through this often difficult process of learning uh, and expressing your voice as an artist. Don't forget to tap the hashtag below 
World Watercolor Month video challenge to see what other artists are painting and sharing on YouTube uh, for World Watercolor Month today. Thanks for watching. I'll be back tomorrow with more watercolor advice you can learn from. Don't forget to include the hashtag World Watercolor Month when you participate and post watercolor art in July.